Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Thank you so much for joining this morning um, for the presentation. So I'm going to get started. There is a lot of material that I want to cover, and I've actually been asked to finish a little bit earlier So because there's another presentation starting after me. So welcome. Like I said, my name is Anara Ladina, and I'm a registered dietitian. And in this webinar, I'm going to be discussing about a healthy microbiome for optimal health. And before I start, um, I would just ask if you guys have any questions, if you could just save them to the end, and I, I will get to all of them. Okay, great. Okay, so I wanted to start off with this quote from Hippocrates. So all diseases begun in, begins in the gut. So he said this about 2,000 years ago, and... Uh, scientists are now discovering in the last few decades that this is actually the case. This is actually true. Um, so this, after this webinar, you guys will be able to understand this in a, in a whole new way, I hope. So for this presentation, or after this presentation, I hope that all of you will be able to better understand what the gut is and the rules of the gut, explain how the brain and the gut are actually connected, you'll have a better understanding of how gut bacteria works and why it's so crucial for our overall health. You will also, I hope, better understand which foods hinder gut bacteria and which foods that actually help the gut bacteria flourish. Um, I will also be explaining what a leaky gut is. I know this term, leaky gut, is, is kind of a, a buzzword and it's been, we hear it a lot and many of you don't understand what exactly that is. So I will be dis discussing that. Um, also for those of you who are thinking about taking a probiotic, I'm gonna be discussing about that as well and giving you some insight and some guidelines on what to specifically look for when you're choosing a probiotic. And lastly, I'm gonna leave you with some lifestyle changes to implement right away. So these are, these are changes that you can do right after this webinar to help improve your gut health and your overall health. So, okay, so when I refer to the gut, um, or anyone refers to the gut, it's such a short terse term, but it actually encompasses a lot of organs. So the digestive tract, or the gut is referred to the digestive tract. So the three main players are the stomach, the small intestine, and the large intestine. But there are other organs that also play a role in digestion, and that is our salivary glands, which starts in our mouth. So digestion actually starts in our mouth. Um, and also other organs, such as the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. So these, all these organs play a huge role in digestion, and the digestive tract is just known or termed the gut. So it's a very short word, but it encompasses a lot of organs. So I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the small intestine. So the small intestine is pretty much the MVP of the gut. So this is where everything happens. So um, the average small intestine accounts for 20 to 30 feet of the GI tract. And like I said, this is where all the magic happens. So digestion, the nutrient absorption, this all happens in the small intestine. So the small intestine needs help from the pancreas and the gallbladder for enzymes that are secreted to the small intestine via specialized ducts. So the internal walls of the small intestine, and you can see in the picture over here, um, they have these small little finger-like structures, which are called villi. So these villi are incredibly important, and the role of that is to increase the surface area. So the more surface area we have, it just means that we have more absorption. And sometimes when the GI tract is compromised or the small intestine is compromised, such as people who have celiac disease, these villi are all flat. They don't exist. So there's no absorption going on in the body. And that can be dangerous, right? It can lead to malnutrition. And also, just to back up, the GI tract is actually a very large organ. If the GI tract was unfolded and laid out, it would span a badminton court. So it's a huge area, uh, you know, the uh, digestive tract. So a lot of things are happening here. Okay, so the roles of the gut. So what does the gut do? First off, it's, it's for food digestion, which is what we all know, right? So it converts the food that we have into usable energy. Secondly, which I talked about this briefly, is nutrient absorption. 
So the gut takes the nutrients from the food, absorbs them, and delivers them to systems in the body. So it breaks down the macronutrients, such as our protein, our carbohydrates, our fats, as well as our micronutrients, and all the absorption happens in the small intestine. Waste disposal. So undigested, unused food residue moves into your large intestine after all the Nutrient absorption goes on in the small intestine and moves through the large intestine. So this is the, where the bacteria in your large intestine turn the residue to feces by removing water from it. And lastly, it's immunity. Okay, so over 80% of your body's immune cells are, are located in the digestive tract. And they connect to the lining of the intestinal wall. So in addition to immune cells, the gut is home to trillions, and I'm going to go into this into detail in a bit, of good bacteria that play a key role in healthy immune function. So diet is a direct influence on the bacteria you have in your gut. So what we eat impacts that this crazy amount of bacteria that's living in our digestive system. So the wrong foods that we're having could lead to an overgrowth of bad bacteria in your gut. So it imbalances um, your, your gut, the bacteria, in order for it to create proper immune cells to help fight infections. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the connection between the brain and the gut. Okay, so we've all had feelings like this where we feel things in a pit of our stomach, right? So sometimes maybe we may be feeling queasy or an uneasy in, a, in an uncomfortable situation. Maybe you have felt butterflies in your stomach when you're you know, about to start a job interview, or your heart beats faster when you're scared or nervous. These are all examples of how the gut and the brain communicate with each other. So like I mentioned earlier, digestion actually begins in the brain and the mouth, right? So the taste, the touch, the smell, it all communicates um, and travels down to our gut. So those gut feelings that we have, we shouldn't ignore because they're real after all. Uh, and the, I'm going to explain in the next slide how this communication happens. Okay, so this communication happens through one of the largest nerves in our body, which is called the vagus nerve. So this nerve, like I said, is the longest one, and it branches out. You can see in the diagram over here. So it starts off in the brain, and it ends in the stomach. And it's bi-directional. So what we're thinking, our mood, it impacts our gut. And what we eat, what's going on in our gut can also impact everything upwards towards our brain. But in that process, the vagus nerve branches out to other organs as well. Okay, so this is really important. Um, and I hope, hopefully this slide really shows how the gut and brain are connected. So like I said, it's a communication highway between your gut and your brain. So before you eat, you have neurotransmitters, chemical messengers, that are sent to your gut via this nerve. And it helps secrete saliva. It prepares your body for gastric juices to help the digestion happen and for muscle contractions. So because the vagus nerve branches out to other organs, um, it influences your heart rate, your blood pressure, and your breathing. So the, the vagus nerve responds to stress and other emotions. So that gut feeling that I was mentioning earlier, this is how it happens, it's through this nerve. <clears throat> so that feeling of scared, anxious, excited, that's all happening through this communication. And the vagus nerve also helps activate the fight or flight response. So this is, um, you know, when we're in a threatened situation, you know, our body goes into this mode, it's called a fight mode. And so when this happens, um, it reduces production of the gastric juices. So the digestive tract is kind of put on the back burner and the blood and everything is redirected to other organs that need, you know, that where all the blood is needed, all the energy is needed. So the digestive tract is actually put on hold. So that's called the fight and flight response. And I'm going to be discussing this earlier. So it happens when we're kind of in a, you know, in a kind of not a safe situation or we're threatened. Okay, so, you know, the digestive system or the gut is also termed the second brain. Um, so the enteric nervous system, the ENS, is actually mostly located in the digestive system. And it's made up of 100 million nerves that help control digestion. Okay, so the ENS is inside the GI tract and it's responsible for 
some of our functions independent of the brain and spinal cord. So things are going on um, and it's not you know, signaling or it doesn't need the brain or the spinal cord to help with these functions. So this is why it's called the second brain. Um, and it's, like I said, it's, it's found in the, in the gut's lining. Um, so gut health and the signals of the ENS sends to your brain, um, it impacts your mood, it impacts, uh, and plays a huge role in disease as well. So serotonin is a neurotransmitter which directly influences your mood, your well-being, um, your pleasure sensors, your appetite, your muscle function, your memory, and how you learn. So this neurotransmitter is so crucial, and about 95% of it is actually found in your gut. So that's a huge amount. Um, and I know in the last few years, we've all know that mental health has really taken a huge role um, and people are just becoming so aware of it because it's impacting so many of us. So this is really interesting because there's so much medication out there for it to help treat anxiety and depression where these medications increase the serotonin in our brain. So this is a really good area or fascinating area to look at for preventative areas for anxiety and depression because there's a link between serotonin and anxiety and depression. So it's, um, it's pretty exciting to, to learn about this because maybe we won't need the need for all these drugs and we can just work on increasing serotonin in, in our bodies naturally. So scientists are now unlocking some of the mysteries of how gut influences the health of our immune system, specifically our mental health and our overall health. So I hope you guys are kind of understanding that the gut health is just so much more than di digestion alone, right? Um, this is where things are all connected. So it's really important to understand that. So gut health, and this is where I get really excited and where um, this area is so fascinating to me because gut health is something that we have absolute control over. Um, you know, we have control over what, you know, we put in our mouths, what our environment is like. So if we can better understand our diet and lifestyle choices that affect our gut, you actually are so empowered to make changes. And that's what I really hope you guys take away from this presentation is that, you know, we have, we have control over our gut health and what we do is a, a direct influence. Okay, so now I'm gonna just be highlighting some of the signs of a healthy gut, like what a healthy gut looks like. Um, so this is just an average. So when you eat your meal, uh, it leaves your stomach anywhere between two to five hours. And bowel movements, which a lot of people don't like talking about, but it's very important. Um, so a normal person would have, or a healthy gut, will have about one to three bowel movements a day. And they should only last a few minutes, it should be soft stool with no pain and very little effort. Okay, so your stool is made up of 75% of water and 25% of it is old cells, mucus, fiber, and bacteria. And a healthy individual should be passing gas between 10 to 18 times a day. So this is just like a rough guideline yeah. of what a healthy gut looks like. Okay, so now I'm gonna be talking about signs of an unhealthy gut. So we all experience occasional GI upsets, such as bloating, excessive gas, heartburn, and it usually happens when something changes. So when, our, when we're traveling or we try different foods, or maybe when we're not feeling well or recovering from something, we may have um, digestive problems. But it's when these issues become your new normal, this is when it's a problem. Okay, so good. other issues, Many manifest outside the gut. So if you're having digestive issues, sometimes it, it may not be related to your gut at all. It could be, um, you know, in your skin, for example. <clears throat> so, so gut and skin health go hand in hand. So people with severe GI issues have skin issues as well. And people who suffer from acne are actually 10 times more likely to have GI issues and inflammation. So inflammation can negatively affect the skin to be a protective barrier. And this is where research is showing that a lot of autoimmune diseases, which I will talk about what they are, um, actually begins in the gut. <clears throat> so we talked about how other issues can manifest outside the GI tract. 
skin health, skin disorders, mental health, and vitamin deficiencies. Um, another sign of unhealthy gut is bloating. So this is when we have too much air, and this could be caused by eating too fast, by chewing gum, by drinking too much carbonated drinks with a straw, stress and anxiety because we're not breathing properly, we're getting too much air in, so we're swallowing too much air. So this can all contribute to bloating, which could impact our gut health. Okay, so to continue, excessive gas. So some foods are, are di a direct trigger, such as beans, lentils, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, sorbitol, fructose, dairy, and whole grains. So these are some foods that can trigger um, people to have more gas and it could cause an unhealthy gut. Having bacterial overgrowth, so small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, also known as SIBO, can lead to excessive bloating. Like I'm talking about bloating that you have so much bloating that you can't even put on your pants. That's how, how um, severe it can be. And this is all contributed to your diet. So people who have SIBO, um, it's their entire therapy is all diet related. It's a very strict diet. And also vitamin deficiencies. Um, if we have an unhealthy gut, you know, like I said, all the absorption takes place in the small intestine. Um, it's not happening properly. So vitamin de deficiencies are needed for gut, the health of our gut microbes, right? So potassium, which we need, um, potassium deficiency is common with those who have an unhealthy gut. B12 and iron is needed by our neurotransmitters. Uh, magnesium, which is needed for bone health and energy levels. They're also impacted as well as iron, which we need for energy and to make red blood cells to carry oxygen to the rest of the body. So these can all be deficient if our gut is not in a healthy state. Okay, so these are some common digestive disorders and diseases that people experience. So GERD, these are just a few of the top ones, there are more. So GERD, which is like acid reflux, ulcers, which happens when you have an over, overactive pathogenic bacteria, gallstones, which is deposits of cholesterol and salt, constipation, which can lead to hemorrhoids, toxic accumulation, and colorectal problems, diverticulitis, which actually are pouches that form in the walls of your GI tract, and IBS. So these um, symptoms usually suffer, people suffer from constipation and diarrhea to two extremes, and they could have up to three episodes a month. So that's, you know, not very comfortable, obviously. Um, IBD, such as Crohn's and ulcerated, ulcerative colitis, which is chronic inflammation, and stress. Stress is huge, so it suppresses the growth of the good bacteria that we need and promotes the bad bacteria. So these are all just common digestive disorders, and there's so many of them. So taking care of your gut is so important. Okay, so now I'm gonna be talking about the microflora. So what are these exactly? I kind of talked about these earlier. Um, so they're referred to as gut bugs. That's exactly what they are. And this picture hopefully depicts, depicts what's going on. Um, you know, it's also known as the gut flora. It's the human microbiome. So it's the microbes, the yeast, the bacteria, the parasites that actually live in the gut. And there are tens of trillions of these guys. And they outnumber our cells 10 to 1. So we have more gut bacteria than we actually have cells. So taking care of these guys should be our focus, right? Um, and they live in our GI tract. And we need these bugs. We need them so much because they produce enzymes to help us absorb nutrients and communicate with our nervous system, our immune and circulatory system. So the microbiota or the bacteria, the gut bugs, we should see them as bodyguards. And the more we have, the better off we are because it just helps everything. Okay, so I also wanna highlight that yes, we have bacteria in our body and we have good bacteria and we have bad bacteria. And the whole goal is to find a balance because they all kind of work together. So when we have too much bad bacteria, that's, that's not good, but we wanna really encourage the growth of our good bacteria, which we can through our diet and our lifestyle. So where do we get our microbiota? Our gut bugs. Well, we actually get them from our moms. Um, and when a baby passes through the vaginal canal, they actually pick up, this is where they pick up all sorts of the microbiomes. 
Now, babies that are born via C-section, um, they do get the microbiomes, but if, if they get it through their mom and dad's skin. And also breast milk. It's filled with microbiomes to help babies build their microbiota, so their healthy gut bugs. So the carbohydrates in breast milk, they actually teach specific bacteria in infants on how to respond to pathogens. Now, it's not clear whether formula, man-made formula, can perform this task. Um, yeah, so that's a really interesting point. And microbiota helps make two important vitamins that we need, our B vitamins and vitamin K. So this is just showing us where we get our microbiota from. So let me just go back. So like I said, we get it from our mom. So having you know, a good diet, especially when you are pregnant, is so important because you're passing everything on to your, to your child. So I just wanted to highlight that. So when we have a poor microbiome, which is when um, our bad bacteria is in overabundance or more in excess than our good bacteria, we have a poor intestinal immunity. So um, another word for this is leaky gut. So our gut is not performing optimally. And this can lead to inflammation. And like, remember I talked about before how the brain and the gut are connected. So this could affect that connection, which could lead to anxiety, depression, stress, IBS. These are all related. So making sure we have a good combination or a good balance of our gut bacteria is so crucial. So what is the leaky gut? So this has been a really hot term in the nutrition world, and a lot of people don't even understand exactly what it is. So I'm really hoping I can break this down easily for you guys. So over the last 30 years, which actually is not too long ago, there has been a ton of research and it has found that cells in the intestinal wall are held together by really tight junctions. So you want to think of these as doors that like to remain closed. And these doors kind of have control over which particles kind of are released in the circulatory system. And this could be uh, good particles or bad particles. So the tight junctions communicate with certain proteins in your intestinal tract. So what can be released? So there's two roles of the gut. So absorbing nutrients and keeping pathogens in check. Okay. So those tight junctions. So in 2000, a uh, researcher, Dr. Eliso Fasano, and his team found that there is a protein that's actually responsible for opening and closing those tight junctions, and it's called zonulin. And um, this has been a huge discovery, and uh, so they've been able to see how those tight junctions, what causes them to open and close. So SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which I kind of highlight earlier is where the nerve or the muscle damage prevents the normal movement of bacteria from the small intestine to the large intestine. So it kind of sits in the small intestine. And this is, can be really uncomfortable for a lot of people. And, and that can increase the zonulin levels in your body. And when you have too much zonulin, those tight junctions remain open. So they don't close, which is very dangerous, as well as gluten. So despite whether you have a gluten intolerance, celiac or gluten sensitivity, anyone who has gluten will open those tight junctions and release material into the bloodstream. However, if you have a healthy immune system, this is not an issue for you. But you know, as we age, as our body goes through different stages, sometimes we may develop some sensitivities or our body you know, may not be responding properly. So this is something that you want to keep in the back of your head, that gluten can open those tight junctions in our intestinal walls. And elevated levels of zonulin um, are elevated in those that have an autoimmune disorder. So just to explain what these tight junctions are, I thought this picture would do justice. So over here on the right, we see a healthy tight junction, right? They're closed. They're, you know, the, it's protecting all the particles from going into your circulatory system. And then on the left, we see um, a faulty tight junction. So the tight junctions are no longer tight. Um, and it's, it's creating space. So all those undigested food particles, the toxins, the bacteria are being released into your body. So this is not good when we have too much zonulin in our, in our, um, in our intestinal wall because it's compromising our GI tract. So zonulin space, um, open spaces between the cells and the gut lining. 
and this leads to leaky gut. So it increases the body's exposure to antigens. So increasing chances of our genes being affected. So, you know, it's so powerful because nutri nutrition can affect health at the genetic level. Um, and this is done with the gut bacteria and it plays a role with communicating with our DNA. So it's so important, right? Like with the foods that we eat and what we surround ourselves in our lifestyle to make sure it's, it's healthy because things can get affected at the genetic level, which can cause a host of diseases. Okay, so examples of autoimmune disease. So autoimmune disease, um, it pretty much your body is attacking itself. It doesn't have that immunity to fight invaders because it's just fighting its own body cells and tissues. So it decreases the body's ability to fight infections or foreign invaders. So these are some examples of autoimmune disease. So celiac disease, people who cannot tolerate gluten, type one diabetes, this is different from type two, IBS, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, Crohn's disease, lupus, eczema. Remember I talked about skin health? So eczema is also seen as an autoimmune disease, same with psoriasis and anemia. So in all these, um, autoimmune disease, a lot of them are being traced to the gut. So research is showing that people who have an autoimmune disease definitely need to be taking a probiotic to help balance the gut, the gut bacteria. Okay, so how do we imbalance our gut? Okay, um, there's a variety of factors. So first of all, our genetics, right? Because we get our good or our microbiome from our moms. So genetics has a big component. Um, however, there's also antibiotics, antacids. These are all disruptors of our balance of our gut because the antibiotics is used to kill bacteria, but it kills all kinds of bacteria, not just the bad ones. It also kills the good ones as well. Traveling, poor diet, stress. Stress is a huge factor. Um, leaky gut, like I talked about earlier, it damages the cell walls, allowing undigested food to enter into the bloodstream, and this could be harmful to our bacteria in the gut. Food intolerances, and also nature deprivation. So it's so important to spend time outdoors because it's actually doing our health a favor, our gut health specifically. So if we look at this, the only thing we really don't have control over is our genetics. But everything else we have absolute control over. So you know, it's so empowering that we have control of our health, especially our gut health. So I want you guys to remember that. Okay, so common food triggers and gut imbalances. So like I said earlier, our diet is a huge impact on our gut health. So simple carbs and sugar. Now this is what the bad bacteria love. This is what they thrive on. So it promotes pathogen overgrowth. Um, other foods that could pr um, promote pathogen overgrowth include mass-produced non-organic animal products. So the modern conventional farming practices, like their biggest goal is just to get their animals ready to be slaughtered. So how do they do this? Well, they have overcrowded farms and all animals are giving a low-dose antibiotic, okay? So just to help prevent infections among you know, the animals on the farm. And they're given a diet that's low quality. You know, they're just trying to get these animals fat so we can, so they can be ready for slaughter. But that all impacts our health. Because if we're eating food that have antibiotics in them, I mean, that's not going to be doing our, our body any justice. So, so um, sticking to, sorry, sticking to having organic as much as possible, that's great because the animals are actually not given any antibiotics. You're not getting any of that hormones and they're actually eating a diet that's you know, sustainable for them, not just making them fat quickly so that they can be ready for slaughter. Also genetically modified organisms. And in my previous webinars, I have talked a lot about GMOs um, and these are man-made <clears throat> and they contain harmful chemical residues that are used in their farming practices. So opting for non-GMO foods is probably something you want to try to do as much as you can. So all these, you know, foods can affect our gut imbalance. Sorry, I am seeing that I have some questions, but I'm going to look at those at the end of the webinar.
So I just want to make sure I go through all the material. Okay, so now I'm going to be talking about the problem with the Western diets, right? So we know that today's diets, it's super processed. We have too many processed sugars, which are high in carbohydrates, and carbohydrates just turn into sugar in our body, and they're low in fiber. So the foods are ultra-processed, and they're denatured food products. So they're being stripped away from their original nutrients and are being replaced with salt and sugar as well as artificially boosted flavors, right? Um, all those coloring, all those dyes, that doesn't really help anything. And it distorts our taste buds and our sensory receptors in the brain. And we can actually get addicted to these flavors. And this includes artificial sweeteners. So artificial sweeteners, you know, it's there's nothing conclusive about them. And wh whatever health professional you talk to, people have their own opinions on it. But in my opinion, I think artificial sweeteners are exactly what they sound like. They're artificial. They're man-made. They're chemicals. Our body doesn't know what to do with them. So instead of, you know, opting for artificial sweeteners such as Splenda, just stick to the real stuff and have small amounts of it. Um, and all these processed foods, these artificial foods, we need to cut them out to retrain our taste buds. Additionally, I want to talk about trans fats and these promote disease. These are probably one of the most unhealthiest foods you can have. Um, they completely imbalance our gut bacteria. They compromise the immune functions. These fats are man-made and it requires, the chemical process requires heavy metal to change its functions. So this is a really dangerous type of fat. And I know it's gotten a lot of... Um, been in the spotlight in the health world for some time now, um, but food companies still use them and they are able to get away with it. And uh, what happens is it's when they're changing a, a fat from a liquid to a solid. And when they change this to a solid, it just increases the shelf life of food. So food can last for a lot longer and it's super cheap to make. So that's why the food companies love them. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. These are some of the foods that I just talked about in the previous slide, you know, that are denatured. They're pretty much just man-made, filled with tons of sugar, salt, coloring, things that you don't want, the trans fats. Like these can last in your shelves forever. You can even see some of the price tags. It's super cheap, right? So it's very easy for consumers to opt for these um, as opposed to making their own. <clears throat> So it's a convenience foods. All these convenience foods, this is where you kind of really want to be careful with. Okay, so another problem with uh, today's diets is the lack of fiber. So fiber is a carbohydrate that our body does not digest. And there's two types of fiber. And the first one is the soluble fiber. So it dissolves in water and helps to lower your cholesterol and your blood sugar. So these are found primarily in peas, oats, apples, carrots, barley and psyllium. Insoluble fiber does not dissolve in water and promotes healthy stool formation. And these are found in nuts, seeds, beans, and most vegetables and whole grains. Now, most high fiber foods have a combination of both. So fiber ferments in the lower GI tract and produces short chain fatty acids, which our body needs, and can help prevent colorectal cancer. And in a nutshell, we all need more fiber. Again, another problem with today's diets is the sodium. So sodium chloride um, are not all created equal. So crystal salt, sea salt, or cur in nature are different than the sodium chloride or table salt as we know it. So it's a very, so sodium chloride or table salt is heavily processed. All the trace mineral, minerals are removed. And because of this, it can lead to water retention, high blood pressure, circulation troubles, which can lead to gallstones and kidney issues. So in nature, sodium chloride has trace elements such as potassium, zinc, magnesium, calcium, all these minerals, which um, really helps absorb, our, absorb the salt that we're having. So we just need to be careful in terms of what salt we are using. So we, need, so we all need sodium for basic cell functions. Our body depends on it. However, you want to stay clear of the refined salts and choose Celtic salt or Himalayan salt, which have those minerals um, and it helps get the iodine absorbed more efficiently. So, you know, I know we hear a lot of processed sugars, but there is such a thing as processed salt, which is table salt. So you want to have, okay, what's termed as dirty salt. So salt that has a, um, like a cloudy color 
And we've all seen these, you know, there's the Himalayan, there's like a grayish tint to some of them. So those are the salts we want to opt for, especially when we're cooking, because it has those trace minerals to help our body absorb it better. So gluten and grains. So this has been such a huge area, right, with gluten-free diets, the paleo diet, the keto diet. Um, and this is where kind of what it's been based on, right? So gluten sensitivity is widespread. And like I showed earlier, remember those tight junctions and that protein zonulin? So for anyone who eats gluten, it's going to kind of make those tight junctions not so tight anymore. So we just want to be careful. So obviously for those who have a gluten sensitivity or who have celiac, Gluten does not stay in the GI tract. It leaks into the bloodstream, which can be very problematic. So refined grains disrupt the, the balance of the gut. Um, remember what I said, refined carbohydrates, sugars, the pathogenic bacteria thrives on all that. So it weakens the white blood cells produced in the intestine. However, if you can tolerate grains and gluten, you know, add whole grains such as quinoa, oats, buckwheat, wild rice, as well as chia, hemp, flax, and sesame into your diet. It's absolutely fine. Okay, so another topic that's also really hot in the nutrition world right now are legumes. And, you know, they've kind of gotten a bad rep as of late. I don't know if anyone has heard of the terms called um, lectins and phytates, which I'm going to explain briefly. So legumes are high in fiber, they're high in protein, and they're a source of carbohydrate. However, they can be an issue for so many of us, which can cause inflammation. So, you know, plants are a living creature, just like animals. So animals, um, when they're in a state of stress or whatever, they can just run away or fight, but plants can't do that. They just they're just there. So their, their seed actually has been designed to be resilient. So legumes are not designed to be digested or absorbed. So that's their way of the plant kingdom to kind of protect themselves away from animals is to have these seeds in them that can make them sick. So legumes have lectins, which are found in all plants, and they're designed to defend against pests and microorganisms. So Bottom line is, if you have a leaky gut or if you, you know, your digestion is not um, at par, having legumes can be very problematic. But one way to help reduce the lectin content um, is to soak and pressure cook them. So for all of you guys out there who have the Instant Pot, which I think is amazing, so this is another great um, way to get your legumes in, just pressure cook them so it reduces the lectin content so you're able to digest it better. So phytates, uh, this is another term which is found in legumes and grains, and this can disrupt the gut because it interferes with absorption, um, absorption of the nutrients since they bind to essential minerals and prevent the intestinal wall from absorbing them. So if you have a healthy gut, legumes may not be a problem at all for you, which is great. Um, however, for everyone, the GI does need to work a lot harder to produce enzymes to digest legumes using vital nutrients in the process. So, you know, I just wanted to highlight this because there are a lot of us who can't digest legumes and it's seen as a health food, but really, you know, some of us may just can't tolerate that and that's okay. Okay, so dairy. So this is another big topic. Um, so the dairy industry has done such a fantastic job of convincing all of us that we need dairy, right? And we're the only kind of mammals um, after infancy that actually do drink milk. We really do not need milk. Um, yes, it has calcium, it has protein, but we can get our calcium and protein needs from other food sources. We do not have to depend on dairy. Um, and our ability to, to digest dairy it has to do with our genetics and our gut health, our gut microbes. So um, a lot of us actually have an intolerance to, to uh, dairy, a huge percentage. Um, and if people's guts are healthy, milk can be tolerated without an issue. So it's the amino acids that are not broken down properly. Um, and the gut allows antigens to be released into the body. And this could lead to inflammation. So if you notice any skin issues, bowel issues, bloating, or breathing issues, you probably want to phase dairy out of your diet. However, if you do have dairy, 
try to stick to organic dairy. Remember I, I talked about this earlier about um, animals, you know, having hormones and um, antibiotics in their feed and they're given that. So you want to have organic so they're free of all of that. You want to stick to full fat because it's less processed and you want to stick to fermented dairy such as kefir and yogurt as, as much as possible. And, you know, we're so lucky in today's day, there's so many dairy alternatives, such as almond milk, cashew milk, soy milk. Um, you know, it's it, we're really lucky to be where we are right now because we have so many different options. Okay, so another factor um, are acrylamides and GMOs. And I know I talked about GMOs briefly. So what are acrylamides? So acrylamides are cancer-causing compounds that are found in overcooked grains and potatoes, which is also known processed foods. They have a lot of acrylamides in them. So at high temperatures, um, the chemical makeup of food is changed. So this makes it very hard for the food to digest. So it just sits there and becomes toxic, toxic in our bodies, which can irritate the lining of our gut and also alters our bacteria. Our bacteria doesn't like that. So GMOs, these are altered their natural state to be more pest and drought resistant. So it helps with the farming practices. So they're able to grow more crop. Um, so there's less nutrition and there's high levels of glycophosphate, which is a herbicide, which has been shown in many studies um, to attack gut microbes. So that's what GMOs are. So this just, you know, just better explains what I was just talking about. So these are where GMOs are concentrated in, in these foods. So if possible, look for organic varieties of these foods. Okay. So you may be wondering now, what do I eat? I've highlighted so many things that we should be mindful of. So you're kind of probably wondering, well, what am I supposed to eat? So you want to stick to whole foods as much as possible. Um, food that haven't been processed. So fruit and vegetables, um, there's certain foods like garlic and leeks, which have powerful prebiotic components called inulin, which promote our good bacteria. So remember before I said the bad bacteria thrives on sugar and refined grains? Well, the good bacteria thrives on fiber. So we want to focus on getting a lot of fiber in. Some foods that are really good for our digestion are bananas, artichokes, broccoli, cabbage, kale, cauliflower, berries, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, arugula, and watercress. Uh, we want to opt to have gluten-free whole grains in moderation. Um, our protein sources, you know, that's great for us. We want to stick to eggs, poultry, fatty wild fish, uh, and meats. Ideally, uh, animal foods that are grass-fed and antibiotic-free, because this can do a lot of damage to us. Fermented dairy, such as yogurt and kefir. And fermented foods, which I am going to be talking about in a bit, such as sauerkraut, kimchi, and miso. And healthy fats. We really need these fats. So nuts, seeds, avocado. Coconut oil, so virgin coconut oil is 50% lauric acid. So this is the same acid that's found in breast milk. So it, um, it's really important to have because it converts it into monolaurin, which helps fight pathogenic bacteria. And I know coconut oil has gotten, it's, it's such a tricky topic because there's research that show it's good for us and then there's studies that show it's not good for us. But at the end of the day, it's a whole food. It is natural. And it's not something that you want to take in excess. So you want to replace. So whatever cooking oil you're using, whatever fat you're using, you want to replace that with the coconut oil. So you don't necessarily have to have tablespoons of coconut oil a day. Like I know some people do that and I wouldn't recommend that. You just want to use it in replace of whatever cooking oil you're using. So I also wanted to spend some time to talk about glutathione. So this is, you know, we hear the word um, kind of antioxidants, right? And we hear that a lot. So this is kind of the mother of all antioxidants, glutathione. And this molecule in the body helps enzymes work in the detoxification process. So we need this glutathione. Um, it's a powerful antioxidant by neutralizing the free radical damage um, that happens in our body. And it's made up of a fatty acids that also con contain a sulfur. So it acts like a mop in our body and it just kind of keeps everything in check. 
it detoxifies our body. So, you know, it's in a healthy state. It's also involved in the methylation process. So methylation is a process that happens. Um, it's a chemical reaction that happens in every single cell and tissue in the body. And the role is very important in detoxing, controlling inflammation, boosting immunity, as well as reproduction as well. Um, so we want our methylation process to be on point always. Um, and if our methylation is not happening properly, this could affect how our genes get affected by our diet and our lifestyle choices. So by eating the right foods, we can really help the glutathione, really promote it and helps with the methylation that we need. So how do we boost our glutathione? Okay, so our foods. So all these foods that I mentioned before have a sulfur compound, so it helps in this process. So garlic, onions, crucifix veggies that contain a sulfur compound, as well as arugula, radishes, watercress, kale and mustard greens. We want to have foods that are rich in vitamin C and E, as well as B6 and B12. These all work together to help promote glutathione. Minerals such as selenium and folate, which are found, you know, beef liver, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you eat this. I don't, <laughs> but it's such a like it's so it's such a nutrient dense food. So having some of that will definitely boost your glutathione. Exercise. So exercising thirty minutes a day at a minimum. That's what we want to aim for because it helps naturally boost glutathione. And you want to limit it eliminate toxic substances from our diet and our environment, such as smoking. Um, you know and. Even for the women out there, you know, a lot of our makeup products, our beauty care products have a lot of chemicals and toxins in them. And our skin is one of our largest organs and it, it can absorb so much from our skin. So all this can really hinder our glutathione and methylation because all that chemicals, we really want to be careful. And I think, you know, I think it's, you know, the beauty industry have, has done a really good job and even our shampoos to help take all those parabens, all those chemicals out. So really be mindful of that. Like, yes, our diet is so important, but it's also what we put in our environment and on our bodies that's just as important as well. So keep that in mind, please. And uh, this all will help to keep our glutathione levels high so it can work its magic in the detox process. So fermented foods. <clears throat> so fermented foods are foods that have been through a process of lactofermentation in which the bacteria feed on the sugars and starch in the food. So it produces lactis, lactic acid. And, you know, fermented foods have been around forever, for centuries. And its main purpose was for preservation because we didn't have refrigerations back then. So it really helps preserve the foods. That's why it was made. And they create enzymes. So fermented foods have lactic acids and probiotics. And it helps with digestion. It replenishes the good bacteria, increases the acid production in our bodies, especially in our stomach. So probiotics are excellent, right? They are good, but they don't come close to the power of food. So bacteria in the foods, the stomach acid that we get from fermented foods is so powerful. And it's also fermented foods are highly bioavailable. Um, body can easily absorb our nutrients from fermented foods. So just for an example, um, our body can absorb 50 to 300 times more vitamin C from fermented cabbage than raw or cooked cabbage alone. So we get so much more bang for, for the nutrition by having fermented foods. It helps calm the gut irritation and regulates transit time. Um, and these are Fermented foods are, are natural in like olives, kefir, matsun, which is a yogurt drink, lessi, yogurt, cheese, miso, nato, tempeh, and kimchi. And the thing is with fermented foods, a little goes a long way. So you can start off small because you don't want to, if you have too much at once, it could lead to an upset stomach, a lot of bloating. So you want to gradually, um, if you're starting off with fermented foods, at about a teaspoon per meal. So that's really little. So, you know, kimchi is great because it's just fermented cabbage. And you can make this yourself or you can even buy it at the grocery store and you can have it to help with your um, balancing your gut bacteria. So again, you just want to start small. Bone broth. I know this um, food has gotten such a huge recognition as of late um, for its health benefits. 
And um, so bone broth is actually when you simmer for 24 hours, bones and meat, and it's filled with amino acids and nutrients that are easily absorbable, okay? And what I like about bone broth is that it's been a staple in every cuisine worldwide for thousands of years. So these are foods that are like our ancestors were having. And another great thing is that it's super cheap and it's good for you. And it's doing justice to the animal because when we have animal foods, we typically tend to have the muscle meats, you know, the chicken breast, the thighs, whatever. So this way you're utilizing every single part of the animal, okay, um, to draw out all the nutrients in the toughest part of the animal, such as the tendon, the ligaments, bones, marrow, knuckles, the skin and the feet. So you're using the entire animal. Um, and by simmering all this for 24 hours, you're increasing the nutrients. So you have proline and collagen, which is known to help promote healthy skin and bones. The gelatin um, helps soothe and repair the gut lining and has glycine and sulfur. Remember, sulfur is good because it helps with our detox process. Um, nutrient absorptions, which help methylation and aid in glutathione production. Glucosamine and chondritin, which is helpful for joint health, and cysteine, which is a powerful antioxidant that boosts the immune system, which is found specifically in chicken bone broth. So this is great because it's not hard to make. Uh, it does take some time, but it's cheap. It's good for you. And um, yeah, it's easy to incorporate. And you can use it as a base for other cooking as well. So supplements and probiotics. Okay, so when you have a compromised gut lining, it's so much harder for your body to absorb the vitamins and minerals, specifically vitamin A and D, which is needed. So, um, you know, if you wanted to improve your gut health, taking a cod liver oil would be a good idea because it's highly concentrated in vitamin A and D. And especially in the winter times, because we're not getting a lot of vitamin D, cod liver oil would be great. And then maybe in the summer months, you want to switch to an omega-3. Cod liver does have omega-3, but not as much as an omega-3. Also digestive enzymes, which can help increase help with the acid production in our body. And as we age, we don't have enough acid. So, you know, that's something you may be noticing. So taking a digestive enzyme could help with that. So in it, you know, just speaking of supplements, you know, food sources is always a better choice than supplements. Okay. Supplements are exactly what they sound like. They just help supplement a healthy diet. So if you are taking a probiotic or are interested in taking one, especially if you've had um, a course of antibiotics, you know, taking a probiotic would be great, especially for children. You want to look for a probiotic that has at least three strains. And these are the lactobacilla, bifidobacteria, and bacillus subtus. <laughs> okay, so what do these all do? So each strain does something completely different. So lactobacilli strains produce lactic acid. It lowers the pH of the mucous membranes, so it's harder for pathog pathogens to live in a low, in an acidic environment. So bifidobacteria helps the immune system and the gut lining uh, integrity helps absorb vitamin D and iron. So bacillus subtilis, which is actually found outdoors in the soil, um, so it alleviates allergies and autoimmune symptoms. It makes digestive enzyme. And this bacteria is actually not permanent in our guts. Um, so it's good to supplement, supplement with this, or you could even go outdoors. You know, if you do a lot of gardening, this is a great way to kind of get that gut bacteria in, and it helps break down material in our bodies. So if you are looking for a probiotic, you want to choose a probiotic that has several strains. So the more diverse, the better for you. Um, for adults, you can take between 15 billion probiotic cells at first for the first several months to heal your gut, and then around 8 billion a day to keep you know, your body in check. And you just want to keep track of how you're feeling if you are taking a probiotic. Because if you give yourself too much at once, it, it could you know, do the opposite and not make you feel so good. So start slow. So these are two brands that I love. Um, I think they're great. They have a lot of good bacteria in them. They're very diverse. So it's the VSL-3 and the HMF powder. So these, sorry, I apologize, it's not so clear, but the HMF, these, these are the strains here. And even the VSL has a very diverse number of strains. You wanna make sure you're looking for those three 
a lot of probiotics will have more than three, which is great. Oh gosh, I only have a few more minutes left. Okay, so lifestyle. I really wanted to touch up on this before I end. So exercise, right? So GI tract is a muscle and regular movement and moderate exercise can help speed things along and it helps with digestion. Exercise helps release toxins from sweat, endorphins are released, it's a stress reliever and mood booster. So remember when I talked about the serotonin earlier when I first started? So exercise naturally helps boost your serotonin levels. So why not, right? Why We should all be doing more exercise. Stress, so stress is the biggest killer. We need to, we need time in our day to decompress and this could th be through exercise, it could be through prayer, it could be a few minutes being outdoors, you know, the less stressed we are, the more productive we are. And even short periods of stress can really imbalance your gut bacteria. So really be careful with that. You know, stress can prevent you from making enough enzymes for digestion. And emotional stress can also make you feel threatened. So remember when I talked about the fight and flight mode? So emotional stress puts us in that fight mode. So our body, you know, is putting digestion on the back burner. And therefore, your digestion is just kind of not getting, it's not, it's not being utilized properly. So in fight or flight, digestion takes a back seat, like I said, it's compromised, and the hormones redirect the energy to where your body needs it, the muscle, the heart, and the respiratory functions. And chewing properly, um, this is something that I encourage all of you to do, to be more mindful when you are eating your meal, when you, you know, you want to aim to have 20 chews per swallow, which <laughs> if you try this, it's kind of hard to do. Um, so don't distract yourself when you have your meals. Pay attention and put your phone away. Um, this is something that I need to do as well. It's so easy. We are so connected with our smartphones, so we need to put those away. Sleep. I really wanted to touch on sleep, and it's really often overlooked. Without sleep, you work um, all your work on diet and exercise can be reversed. You need seven to nine hours of sleep a night. And chronic sleep deprivation can lead to met uh, metabolism issues, which, you know, this can also affect our serotonin levels. So we need to have, we need sleep for cell renewal and cell repair when we sleep. Okay, so lastly, I'm so sorry, I'm running out of time. Um, these are some takeaways that I want you guys to implement today. You know, these are daily habits for gut health. So make sure in your day you have some quiet time to meditate. You know, go take an, a walk outdoors. The weather this weekend is so nice. Um, the days are getting longer. So go spend some time outdoors. You can, you know, do prayer, even yoga. Start with 10 minutes to have that time to yourself. Hydrate. You want to aim to be drinking between two to three liters of water a day. And this just helps remove our toxins. Again, chewing your food, 20 chews per mouthful. And be mindful, eat in a calm state and be mindful. When you see your food, you know, take a minute to appreciate it. Because um, remember, digestion happens in the mouth. So when we see our food, our salivary glands start to work, you know, the acid in our stomach starts to work. So you just want to take it easy and let your body kind of, you know, do its thing instead of just rushing to eat our meal. Exercise, sleep, and journaling. This is another great way to help, you know, just stay in a calm state. So one thing that could help is journaling is to write down what brings you happiness without the need for another person. Um, so these are just some mindful practices to help you, which can help your gut health as well. So I, I don't know if I have time to answer any questions. Um, I will try right now, but if you do have questions, please, I encourage you to email me. Um, at anara.aladina at gmail.com. You can also find me on social media, Instagram and Facebook. And um, let me see if I can see the questions. I don't know where all my questions went. So I hope, um, I, I have no idea where all my questions are. I'm gonna to try to find them. Okay, hold on. Like I saw a bunch of questions being popped up while I was speaking, and it was really hard for me to get to them while I was talking, so I don't know where they went. Okay. 
Okay, I'm trying to find the chat group, but okay, here they are. Okay. Um, so nut allergies is a way to fix this allergy. So unfortunately, at this point, there isn't a way to fix them. However, if your children are young, there are some strategies that can be used. Um, so if you have, you know, now before they were saying to stay away from peanuts, uh, but now they're trying to encourage that to have kids at six months to encourage them to have some nuts to see how they can tolerate that. So that's something you could try. Um, how to keep blood platelets count normal if it's high, what to eat, any remedies. Um, so in terms of gut health, uh, you know, you just want to make sure that your iron levels are, are normal. And if it means that you have to supplement, then that's okay. Some of us are not able to, if, especially if you have anemia. So you want to look, um, you know, it's just, you need to talk to your, your doctor with this because you don't want to just take iron pills because if your body's not absorbing it, then you're not doing yourself any favors. So don't just take iron pills if you have low iron have low red blood cell count. You really want to look at the underlying condition for that. Um, so which sugar is better from rice, malt, honey, maple syrup, or coconut palm? Okay, that's a good question. So yes, so all of them are natural sources. So you want to stick to a natural source. Um, so they're, they're all actually fine to have. I prefer maple syrup, but that's just my preference. But you can use whatever natural sweetener you want. You just want to have small amounts of it. So where can you buy Celtic? sea salt, Himalayan salt. Yeah, pretty much the cooking ratio is, is pretty much one-to-one. -one. You may have to adjust it a bit because they're larger chunks. Um, and you can get this anywhere. You can get this at Costco. You can get it from a health food store. Um, even some grocery stores do carry the Celtic salt and the Himalayan salt. But you can look at them. You can get them online. But definitely Costco has them as well. to scroll up to see okay here we go okay it's a brand of almond milk um there is a brand that i love it's called cali milk and um you can get this i've seen it at no frills in the health food area i've seen it at longos sobeys um even making your own it's actually not hard to do but you can definitely buy buy that and i'll write it over here Yes, so when you're making bone broth, is it just bones or with vegetables? Yeah, you can definitely add vegetables in there, especially the vegetables that I mentioned. You can you can use that, but you you definitely want to use the entire like bones of the animal as much as you can. And you can go to uh, butcher shops and they they actually have like bags that you can pick up for super cheap to get the bones of animals. Okay, so what other alternative for fiber would you recommend? So fibers, again, are found in whole grains, fruit and vegetables. So I highly recommend getting them from natural food sources as much as possible. So fruit and vegetables, those are your main sources that you want to get them through. And then our whole grains. Um, if you are talking about a supplement, there are supplements such as, uh, you know, Metamucil, but you can also pick up psyllium husk, which is natural fiber. You can mix that in water and drink. Um, chia seeds are incredibly high in fiber. So adding that to your foods, um, even adding that to water and drinking that would be great as well. But you want to really be careful that um, if you're having a lot of high fiber foods, you want to drink water. Okay, so I've just been told that I need to log off because there is another um, presentation starting at 12. So thank you again so much for tuning in and I hope you guys were able to learn something and um, enjoy your weekend. Thanks everyone.